Welcome to Tech Data's 30 Minutes with a Hacker. Thanks everyone for joining this next episode of 30 Minutes with a Hacker. My name is Jade Whitty. I'm a Solutions Development Manager with Tech Data and our Security Services Group. And with me here today is Alex Riles and Brett Scott. Brett has been with us on every podcast that we've had for the last couple of years, and we've been including Alex Riles in a little bit more often. And uh, maybe you two should just introduce yourselves real quick to get this going. Yeah, my name is Alex Riles. Uh, thanks for the intro, Jade. I'm the global VP of our security business here at TechData. Really excited to join you guys today and chat a little bit about security. My name is Brett Scott. I'm a director level here at TechData and I oversee the TechData Cyber Range, which is the first of its kind in distribution. And uh, we are focused very heavily on cybersecurity training, enablement, demonstration, and experiences. So as we're getting into this, you know, last Last podcast, we talked about the Colonial Pipeline breach. So if you haven't listened to that podcast, I highly recommend that you do because we really got into some great topics and uh, really drilled into zero trust. And today's topic is around demystifying the concept of SASE, which stands for Secure Access Service Edge. Not a lot of people know what that, that, what that it actually stands for. It's just SASE is becoming really hot right now in the industry, but there's a lot of confusion around it and uh, kind of what is it, what are, what are the nuances about it, why is it gaining popularity? So today we're going to demystify that a little bit, but we've had some breaches that have been happening. The Colonial Pipeline breach, it was followed up by the JBS meatpacking plant that was hacked and it's impacting all of us across the country. And there's a lot of visibility around it. I just like as we're getting into this, maybe Brett and Alex, you can touch a little bit on why you think these types of breaches are having, why they're escalating, why we're seeing more of these types of sophisticated breaches. We've seen how uh, a lot of the folks that felt like they had cybersecurity dialed in and they had that it, it working properly probably had their formula wrong. And the bad guys are simply demonstrating to the good guys yeah, you came to the battle ill-equipped for this fight. And because of that, because of the lack of preparedness, because of the lack of capability, um, the bad guys are having an absolute field day, stealing, disrupting, and causing great harm to those folks who did not get it right in the first place. Yeah, I agree with that, Brad. I, I would add that the reason we keep seeing these attacks day after day is that companies have failed to realize a fundamental truth. And that is that We've, we've moved our data. <laughs> uh, historically, our data has always lived in our data centers, and therefore we built security strategies uh, that were centered around having firewalls and protecting at all costs the, the castle uh, of our data center. And the truth is, especially in a post-COVID world, our data has moved. It's now out in the cloud. It's at uh, Amazon, it's on Azure, it's at salesforce.com and on Workday and all these SaaS apps in the cloud. And so since our data has moved, I think a lot of companies have struggled to figure out how to adapt their security strategy to not only protect the data in those locations, but authenticate their users correctly to that data. And if you mess up authentication, then you allow bad guys access to your data through lots of different ways. And that's where we see a lot of these data breaches happening. If you look at a lot of these recent breaches, they've, they've been centered around leveraging vulnerabilities in cloud-based services or authentication limitations or something like that. So the cheese has moved, our data has moved and we have to respond correctly. And I think a lot of customers are struggling with that. Yeah, so thank you for that. And I, I agree with you. And so SASE has gained a lot of momentum in the industry right now. There's also a lot of misconceptions around it. And that's why we really wanted to dive into this a little bit further. And let's let's start off with kind of defining what SASE is. And Alex, maybe you can do that, kind of lay the groundwork for us. Sure, I'll take a stab at it. So um, SASE is a secure access service edge, which is not super descriptive, but let me try to break it down. Uh, it's the idea that instead of having our network perimeter be our firewall around our corporate data center, we're pushing that perimeter out to the end user level 
as they access the cloud resources. You could think about almost the perimeter is the user because on your laptop, whether you're in a hotel room or in Starbucks, as you access your cloud resources or your on-premise data center resources, you are going to be going through in a SASE world, a cloud service where all those security capabilities that we know and understand today, like encryption and like uh, deep packet inspection and things like uh, monitoring of services and cloud access security broker capabilities, remote browser isolation, all these services that we historically put in the data center, we're now pushing out to a cloud service because it's gonna ultimately improve the access for the end user that historically had to VPN from the Starbucks in Chicago all the way back into the corporate data center to be routed all the way back out to Office 365. And that was a lot of overhead and, and uh, challenge for the, the packets to have to travel that far. Now we can just have you sitting in a Starbucks and you have a local agent on your local device that will send you to a a SASE cloud service that can inspect your traffic, make sure you're authorized to access your cloud workload, make sure that you are accessing things, not, not stealing data that you shouldn't be stealing. And it's much more efficient to go straight from wherever you are straight into your cloud workloads instead of having to route all the way through a corporate network. So SASE kind of pushes everything out to the edge, we call it, which is why it's secure access service edge so that we have more efficiency. Some of the cloud services that we leverage with the security cloud services we leverage with SASE are gonna be things like figuring out who you are and do you have access to a resource? What type of device are you leveraging? What location are you coming from? And should that impact what you should access and what you shouldn't? Um, do you behave like we expect you to behave in terms of how fast you type and what websites you go to and what files you access? All those services are now in the cloud um, that your traffic will route through on its way to Office 365 or Workday or Salesforce.com. So SASE is really just about pushing that network edge out of your data center to the world we live in, because now we're all accessing our data wherever it happens to live. Totally. Uh, it, 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 SASE represents a, a new reality, and that new reality is what used to be a castle and a moat uh, turned into everybody works from home and I urge everyone listening to this podcast, do not make the mistake of assuming because you did the one and you've done the other, you've got the hybrid cloud, cloud solved. You probably don't because hybrid is a completely different modality from one or the other. SASE is a great step forward in helping you to overcome the complexities of dealing with a hybrid workforce that are working both within trusted networks and networks that you don't know what they're, what's going on. So it is really important that you evolve with the, the uh, evolution of the industry so that you're not fighting with uh, inadequate technologies uh, to try to survive in this crazy complex world of cyber attacks. And I think we have a technology that it's evolving to the point where we can implement something like this. We've been forced to implement it because we now have remote workers. We're starting to get used to working in a different environment and people don't really want to go back into the office, um, at least not as much. And so as we start leveraging the cloud more and more, our, it's becoming more critical that we figure out ways of securing it. So the technology's evolved where we can actually inspect the data at the edge at a level that we really need to. Whereas before we were blocking access into let's say our data center and once you got in, if you're a hacker, you could move around. Now we are, with, with SASE, we are actually able to see behavior. So from a zero trust perspective, once you get into the network and you're accessing information, it's constantly evaluating on a continual basis whether or not you are accessing the right information, should you be is this normal? Is this outside of the normal behavior? And all those types of attributes now, we have the technology to be able to capture that. Yeah, we call that actually, that's a great description, Jade. We call that context-based uh, analysis. So with SASE, our user traffic is going through this cloud service that allows us to inspect all the data. And it's different from historical systems where historically we were just looking at web traffic only. Am I allowed to go to this website URL or not? It's a whitelist or, or blacklist. 
Nowadays, we not only inspect the URL you're going to, but we can also look at all other types of cloud traffic, not just URL web traffic, but API traffic between web applications in the cloud. And we can inspect it and look for context. So whereas before you would authenticate into your corporate network and we would say, yes, you're allowed in, as you mentioned, now we want to not only do that, but then constantly evaluate, but are you really who you said you are? Um, are your clicks of your, brow uh, your browser the way that Jade normally clicks or are they not? Are you connecting from a device we've never seen before? Are you collecting from a location we've never seen before? All this is what we call context. So the most important part of SASE is that it has to collect all the information about traffic in your network through the cloud services so that it can make decisions and build a profile of who you are and decide constantly, should you be allowed to be here or not? And if something looks out of place, it won't necessarily kick you out. It's just going to present you with more authentication, maybe another factor of authentication to validate that you are who you say you are. And this is how we catch the bad guys, because uh, you know we know from the Verizon Data Breach Report that a bad guy's in your network an average of 180 days before you ever find out he's there. And he's planning that next ransomware attack, and he's planning how he's going to exfiltrate your data. So it's important that we are constantly watching all the traffic on the network, not only in the corporate data center, but also as we access our cloud services so that we can spot these anomalies and hopefully kick out the bad guy before he does something wrong. Yeah, this uh, in old uh, old defense in depth parlance, this is uh, uh, heuristics, right? And it, they were never implemented very well before. It was clunky and awkward and difficult. Uh, this uh, using a SASE greatly simplifies implementing heuristics, which are essential going forward to detect that uh, that uh, pl uh, plausible, credible, but actually malicious activity. Identifying it so that your security team might actually be able to do something about it. You know, there's another huge benefit of that, Brett, which is, you know, historically all traffic went through a VPN back to the corporate network with, where you had your firewalls and your proxy servers and all the technology. And you had to have expensive, hard to find security people to build, administer, buy, manage all that equipment. Well, with a SASE solution, you're basically pushing all that same technology out to a cloud service managed by a vendor, which brings re less reliance on the, our customers to have those hard to find security resources, because now you don't have to buy your own firewall or your own software web gateway and configure it and manage it, support it. All that's done and abstracted away in a SASE cloud service. So all the traffic still goes through all the same technology. It's inspected, it's decrypted, et cetera but you don't have to necessarily know how it all works and manage it yourself. It's cheaper for the customer um, and, and certainly less overhead in support and you just pay a monthly fee. So that's a huge benefit. I think SASE is bringing the market. These customers who are realizing uh, I'm a meatpacking plant. That's what I do for a living. Like I don't know anything about cybersecurity. So for them to have to go buy the right security products, install them, manage them, configure them, it's just not tenable. But if you uh, if they, they can pay a monthly subscription fee and offload that function to someone who knows how to do it, that's a win for everybody. You're taking a step forward in cybersecurity. You're taking a step back in terms of total all cost. You're helping you overcome the cybersecurity skills gap, which is real and growing. And most importantly, uh, you are moving your organization into a place where it could do something, right? If cybersecurity is all about the ability to observe. So if you had a, a, a hub and spoke network and you had all these users in all these different places doing all these different things, you'd have to have technologies in all of those places to be able to observe what's going on. You are greatly simplifying your, your cybersecurity complexity by having all of those locations pass through your SASE cloud, which gives you a single point of observation where you can then quickly identify stuff that should or should not be happening. I think it's around efficiency as well. I mean, JBS is the the largest, I guess, beat packing plant in the, in the world. So they have the resources to implement IT at a high level, whether or not that's the most efficient use of those funds remains to be seen. But I think what's driving this is the, the, the need to have remote access and people not necessarily working the way they were in the past. So being able to push that out to the edge and the actual people becoming now the edge of the network is, is the shift that's happened. And so that's why companies are adopting this. 
you, you see a movement happening where a lot of companies are realizing this is hot and this is the direction things are going and they're trying to, to log, to tap into it. Maybe they've got one little component of sassy, a product that they have, and they now want to say, oh, we're, we're sassy now, we're in this space, when they're really not in that space. And so there's a lot of me too's and people jumping in, but there's some specific components of sassy that our Gartner has called out and that the industry is really starting to solidify around. Alex, I don't know if you want to touch a little bit on those components. I think that would be good just to kind of walk through those to get clarity on that. Yeah, we can certainly do that. There, there are several potential components in a SASE solution, and they're, they're oftentimes the same components you would deploy in an on-premise solution, to be honest, the uh, just deployed in a slightly different way. In fact, I also want to mention that while a SASE solution is good and important, you, you made a good comment, Jay, that that's for remote access users. We're not taking away the importance of still having these components like a, um, like a next-gen firewall and a software web gateway, all those things inside your data center still have a role and a purpose because we have business apps inside of our network in our corporate data center as well that need to be protected. But when it comes to securing our end users and applications outside of the corporate network, that's where SASE kind of plays and shines. So the components I would mention would be a cloud access security broker, we call it CASB, which is all about monitoring managed and unmanaged business applications in the cloud. Typically, when we think of CASB, we think of taking an application like maybe salesforce.com that has an API and a CASB solution can tie into that API and ensure that communication is secure and ensure that authentication is handled. And, and that's an important part of CASB. I think what SASE brings to the table to enhance CASB is, is allowing that CASB concept for unmanaged applications. So applications that don't necessarily have a full API capability like a salesforce.com would. Because with SASE, I can, I'm on my laptop in Starbucks, I have my little uh, agent there. So all my traffic off my laptop goes through this agent. It forwards me to a cloud service from a vendor who, who sells SASE. And those services are going to be able to watch all the traffic to a, a, a cloud application that maybe is not a traditional uh, high profile managed cloud application. And we can still encrypt the data. We can still look at the data, look at, uh, gra grab context from the data, make sure that uh, the identity of the person who's trying to access that unmanaged application still is, is authenticated to it. So cloud access security broker is one component that is really an important piece of a SASE solution, but there are many other pieces. Uh, another I'll mention, and maybe I'll throw it over to Brett to mention some, uh, a next-gen secure web gateway capability is another really important piece because secure web gateways are not new. We've had them for a decade, but historically, we also called them proxy servers. They sat inside your corporate network at the edge of your network, and they were basically evaluating all your employees who sit at their desk. They were looking at all the websites they go to and saying, oh, you're allowed to go to this website. You're not allowed to go to that website. Well, that, that's an important thing to do, but the truth is most attacks today aren't really about the URL you go to. It's about the dynamic content on the website you go to. So you might go to a perfectly valid whitelisted website, but there may be a uh, set of JavaScript running on that site that the site hoster doesn't even know about that can inject malware into your, into your computer. So it's more important than ever for us to expand this concept of a secure web gateway beyond just whitelisting URLs to actually evaluating the traffic that's going back and forth through API calls and JavaScript calls and, and all that to make sure that it doesn't have malware or isn't trying to do something nefarious. And that's what these next gen uh, web security gateways do. They, they actually can do sandboxing and they can do some data loss prevention capabilities. They might add remote browser isolation capabilities. They could add firewalls, a service kind of capability. Maybe advanced threat protection could be built into these next gen uh, software web gateways. Some level of endpoint security or identity and access management hooks into an identity system. All these are micro security services that you can gain access to when the software web gateway first decrypts the data and then inspects it and then pulls context from it and then runs it through these engines that 
that are various types of security engines. So it's a, it's a super important component of a SASE strategy. So all of the principles of zero trust apply to your SASE cloud as well. And uh, because of that, the ability to segment and route traffic individually per application based on which users should or should not have access to that. If you really play SASE well, then you're going to have a whole bunch of strategies about your temporary and, uh, and non, non-permanent access as well as the uh, full evaluation of least privilege principles in dealing with who has access to what and should people be here or not there, et cetera. Uh, that's both for devices and for people. I actually want to circle back on the zero trust thing because uh, uh, one of the technologies you called out was RBI or remote browser isolation. This is something that is a, a big block solution for security. If I am, if I have a robot that is doing the surfing for me and I'm using my browser and I don't realize that the robot is between me and the rest of the internet, if something bad happens, if the robot goes and goes to one of those legitimate sites that has that malware on it through advertising, whatever it is that's there, it's the robot that gets destroyed. And therefore I and my machine and all the things that are there are protected from that walking on a landmine, right? Where I'm protected from that type of thing. So in the, in the uh, where do I invest my money uh, perspective of things, um, that is one of the solutions that gets you a lot of ground because you're helping to overcome the user skills gap, right? Um, Tech Data, we're a really big company. We have tens of thousands of employees. Um, we still have people that click on stuff they shouldn't be clicking on. We've been doing training on don't click on things you're not supposed to be clicking on for years and years and years. And, it's, and so humans are not great at the technical complexity of the adversary. So having something like RBI helps you to overcome that user skills gap deficit. Uh, none of it negates your need to train users. None of it takes away from what you're already doing uh, or your need to do it. But this gives you one more insular layer that protects you from users that maybe make a mistake or maybe do something they shouldn't do. Great point, Brett. It, Alex, I've heard you explain RBI, remote browser, browser isolation to others. I think you have a great way of explaining it. Maybe explain that to the audience. Yeah, Br- Brett did a good job uh, with a good analogy around the robot concept. You're basically putting a layer of protection between you and the website you're trying to get to. Because if you think about the way a lot of attacks happen, um, you have your browser, you hit a website, the, the, the HTML code downloads to your browser and executes, but inside of that is JavaScript. And JavaScript can, you bad guys can inject bad malicious JavaScript that can execute local in your browser on your computer and through vulnerabilities in different types of web browsers, you know, sometimes it can escape the container of the browser and actually make changes to your machine. So what if we could, we could look at websites without actually executing any dynamic code on your computer. That's what remote browser isolation does. Basically, this robot Brett referred to is like a proxy. It's a middleman between you and the internet. So that the pro- if you request Amazon.com as a website, the proxy server in between will request that for you, grab the dynamic website, and then it takes a screenshot of the Amazon website and sends you the screenshot to your browser. So now what you're looking at in your browser is not a dynamic website running JavaScript and other technologies. It's just a static image of the Amazon website. But the refresh rate of clicking on things in that dynamics in that static screenshot is so fast that you can't tell you're not interacting with a regular website because as soon as you click on something that remote proxy that robot referred to is running back out grabbing that next updated page taking another static image sending it to your browser and it happens so quickly that you just don't even know what's happening. But if, if there's no dynamic JavaScript running in your browser, you can't get malware that way. It's the safest way to browse the internet, right? And to Brett's point, if any bad stuff happens, it will happen at the proxy server level, not on your laptop level. And we can have other security on the proxy server to detect problems and isolate the problem there at that level. It's all about creating a level of abstraction and uh, keeping the end users safe from harming themselves which we sometimes do with clicking things we probably shouldn't click. Well, I'll tell you another thing that is really important. So um, privacy is not on the lips of everybody and every company that's out there, but I promise you it's coming and it will be. So when you're using something like an RBI and a SASE cloud, 
you're actually getting a byproduct of greater privacy for your employees. And that's good across the board. So again, that's, that's a future reality that's not present uh, in, of mine. But uh, for those of us who are in the cybersecurity expert world, uh, when you use these types of solutions, you're gaining privacy for your employees, which will profoundly benefit you in years to come. That's a great point. Yeah, thanks, Brett. So I'm thinking, what are some of the vendors, and I know we're a distributor tech data, just to kind of give that brief you know, overview. We're a Fortune 100 company. Not a lot of companies have, people have heard about us, but we are global and we work with a slew of vendors that we distribute their products. There are some vendors that are strong in the SASE space, and, and maybe we should just mention a few of those, Alex. So there are a lot of vendors popping into the space of SASE in the market. So a lot of VCs are investing in companies right now, which is a lot of fun to watch. There are several that have matured to the level they're ready for the channel specifically, and, and TechData is working with several of those. Some that come to mind, uh, Zscaler is a leader in this category in the market. And in North America, we've recently signed a relationship with Zscaler we're, we're very excited about. Fortinet acquired a company, Opaque Networks, not too long ago that uh, they branded that solution as Fortisassi. Uh, which is a great example of a full SASE based solution in the cloud with a lot of microservices that are very valuable. McAfee has a technology, their Envision Unified Cloud Edge solution is a SASE type of an offering, which is really exciting to see. And, and we're seeing a lot of deals coming there. And then I'll, I'll throw an honorable mention out, Cisco Umbrella, while probably not a full SASE solution, has a lot of those attributes and a lot of great capability, especially around DNS security and things like that. So uh, Cisco Umbrella is another good good option. So there's several that Tech Data offers today. We're in talks with many other vendors that are in this category because we view this as the future of security. Cloud is uh, where all the business apps are. And so security is, is we're having to rethink our security architectures in the cloud. And a lot of companies are uh, coming up with their variation of what SASE is and how they can solve that equation for their customers. So that's great, Alex. So how do our listeners get help with SASE solutions and find those types of solutions? Is there anything out there that we can, we can leverage? Yeah, that, that's a great uh, question, Jade. I would suggest that uh, as a distributor, Tech Data is enabling channel partners across the globe to help customers. So what I would suggest is that you look for a local channel partner who uh, can help you with your security architectures. I would also point you to a tech data resource, techdata.com slash security, where you can find a lot of information and tools and resources that you can leverage to learn about concepts like SASE and what is it, how does it work, zero trust. We have some products out there like our Tech Data Cyber Range and other things that you can leverage. And you can also find information about how to find a Tech Data sales rep who could point you to a local partner who would be helpful to you. We'd love to, to teach you more about security concepts like we do on these podcasts and, and be a resource for you. Great. Well, I know we're kind of coming up to the 30-minute uh, mark, so I just want to thank you guys, and I hope that our listeners found this uh, interesting and it demystified it a little bit. SASE is really hot right now. Cybersecurity is hot, and there's a big push in this space, so hopefully this has helped you. I want to say thank you, Brett, as always, for your contribution and being on these and sharing your insights and knowledge, and Alex, it's always great having you on these as well. So hopefully we can have you on more of these in the future. So we'll wrap this up and I look forward to next month's podcast on 30 Minutes with a Hacker. Thanks, everyone.